Mr. Whitton, you are now about to address uh, the inquiry, I think, on behalf of those undercover officers represented by Slater and Gordon. Of the 12 former undercover police officers we represent, a number did have relationships. It's important not to have preconceived ideas. It's the morning of the second day of the inquiry and time for some of the men in our story to be heard, including Mark Jenner, Jim Boiling and James Straven. They're saying they've been treated unfairly and had untold disruption to their lives. This is Bed of Lies, Episode 7, Inquiry, Part 2. Former undercover police officers are affected individually and significantly. Moral vilification can have a lasting impact, particularly when no criminal offence has been committed. Public inquiries can be demanding for all those involved. As for a number of those we represent, it will become clear that their service and this inquiry has had a significant impact on their mental health. On that last point, there is evidence that going undercover for years can result in psychological issues. Neil Woods, the drugs cop, is diagnosed with chronic PTSD. I suffer from moral injury, a profound sense of guilt because of the harm that I have caused to other people. It is an extraordinary psychological pressure to maintain a lie for that long. It's difficult work, and the officers knew that going into it. And now they believe the police haven't supported them sufficiently. But what was life like for them after their deployments came to an end? Where are they now? I've asked Donal O'Driscoll from the Undercover Research Group to run through what happened to each man. First up is Mark the Climber, a.k.a. Mark Kennedy. Mark Kennedy, following leaving the police, is believed to have gone to America for a while. He's since returned to the UK and has been a security manager at a firm in the southwest of England. But there's something unique about Mark. He actually left the police a year before Lisa discovered that he was a cop. Just around the time of his breakdown at the 69ers party, the police had pulled him out. And for the final year of their relationship, he was actually working for a private security company called Global Open, run by a former special branch officer. Mark was a corporate spy. I think it's one of the big issues that has received the least amount of attention. It's, a, as far as we can tell, an essentially unregulated sector. Uh, we suspect there's an awful lot more going on there than has ever, ever made it out. Uh, it has, for the most part, slipped under the radar. And this is, in fact, the reason the whole scandal blows open in the first place. Because without the support of the police, Mark doesn't have any fake documents. And that's why Lisa finds that passport for a Mark Kennedy on holiday in Italy. Next is Mark Cassidy, the man from Birkenhead, who was with Alison for five years. Or to use his real name, Mark Jenner. Mark Jenner, up until a few years ago, was still a serving police officer. He was, to the best of my understanding, still within a specialist unit, but not special branch. He has since retired. Carlo Neri, Lindsay's Italian boyfriend, the one who took her to Venice, his real name's protected by the inquiry. But he's still a police officer. And he's left his wife, who he was married to throughout his deployment, for a woman he met while acting undercover. His third activist girlfriend, that is. And what about Andy Van, the one who went out with a 19-year-old Jessica and wrote the Tradecraft Manual? He's, in fact, Andy Coles, and his story's pretty interesting. Unlike the other officers in our tale, he's in the public eye. Andy Coles remained a serving officer for a number of years after he was deployed. He's since retired and moved to Peterborough, where he has been a school governor. In 2015, he's elected as a Tory councillor. Then he's appointed as a deputy police and crime commissioner for Cambridgeshire. But for many years, the truth about his past was hiding in plain sight, waiting to be discovered. My older brother Andy brought his own drama with him. He looked like he'd just walked out of the woods, his hair long and shaggy, with a straggly beard, his ears rattling with piercings. But his disarray was not like mine, an outward sign of internal distress, but suffered in the line of duty. He had joined Special Branch, 
and was undercover, living a double life, infiltrated into some sinister organisation while his wife and baby daughter made do with unpredictable visits. That celebrity reverend and former pop star Richard Coles, reading from his autobiography, Fathomless Riches. And with that chapter, he unwittingly outs his brother. Donal O'Driscoll and the undercover research group can unmask Andy Coles. In the wake of the news, he resigns as police and crime commissioner. He remains a Tory councillor to this day. This hasn't been without its controversy, though. Before the pandemic, Jessica and some friends run a campaign to sack Andy Coles. They'd go up to Peterborough about once a month to hand out flyers and picket the council. And it's on one of these trips that Jessica comes face to face with Andy. He was stood sort of about like 10 foot away from me with his camera up, sort of filming me, um, which, yeah, was a huge shock. You know, I haven't seen him in all those years. So I pulled my hat down over my face and just walked away. Her friend covers his face with leaflets but stays where he is, and Andy walks up to him and snatches them. And ran off saying, we're going to go to prison, um, that we've broken the law and we're both going to jail. And with that, we just, we just turned around and walked away. Through all this, Andy denies having a relationship with Jessica. He's been quite derogatory about, you know, myself and the group that I was in and, you know, sort of like, you know, calling me an extremist and all kinds of stuff. And so she goes to the police and lodges a formal complaint about him for deceiving her into a relationship. Nearly two years later, uh, so actually in December, I got notification that they had upheld my complaint and they said that, you know, had he still been um, employed by the police, then he would have a case to answer for gross misconduct. In all the months I've been reporting this story, I've tried to reach Andy Coles, but his phone keeps going to voicemail. So I try one last time, and to my surprise, he picks up the phone while he's in the car. Hello? Hi, is that Andy? Yes, speaking. Hi, Andy. My name's Cara. I'm calling from The Telegraph. I'm, oh, hello. I'm um, making a podcast about undercover policing, and I wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions. I'm really sorry. I've, I've had very clear legal advice on this. I, I can only start talking when we get to the undercover inquiry. I'm afraid I can't really help you. And, and just in terms of your position as a Tory councillor, um, yeah. I, I know there's been a campaign to remove you from that post. Do you have anything that you say to people on that? I've, I've made one statement, which is to say I, you know, I, I deny everything that's been said about an uh, inappropriate sexual relationship that I maintain throughout. That hasn't changed. It won't change. OK. Did you have a statement in response to the um, Met Police upholding the complaint on that earlier this year? Uh, they didn't. What? A complete misinterpretation of the letter. I have a copy of the letter, but I'm afraid, again, I can't go into that. But, um, uh, you know. what, how, what would you say um, the rough kind of um, outline of what that letter says, then, if it's different to the okay. news reports? Well, just to explain what happens generally, I won't talk about my own case, if that's all right. OK. Uh, but whenever, whenever an officer is in, um, faces a, a criminal uh, inquiry, which I did, after that it then goes from criminal inquiry into uh, an internal police inquiry. So every single time it happens, that's what happens. And then, um, so all I was expecting, which is what was said, was that were I still serving, an internal inquiry would have been held. That's completely normal and under every case. So to say it was upheld is an absolute travesty. OK, so you disagree with that wording in the news reports from the time? Well, it was deliberately phrased that way. I think it was really, that came from, from the other side. Um, but, you know, I have a copy of, of the letter that was sent that the, the cops I was talking to, they were pretty annoyed about it because the, it had really just taken the line out of context out of the letter that was sent to say, yes, had, had I still been serving, I would have faced an internal inquiry. And that's perfectly normal. Every officer would expect that. OK, thank you for clarifying that one. Um, right. it's, it's one of those issues that's really complicated. Yeah, no... Um, because I, you know, if I could speak publicly about it, of course I would, and, and the story would be somewhat different from that which has been herded around you, as Churchill said. You know, the, um, 
the light gets up around the world before the truth gets put inside. It's very much the case. And without going into details then, because you're saving that for the inquiry, um, are you able to say on the sort of ramifications that this has had on your life? In a personal way. I, no, I can't say, but it's been substantial. But I, I won't go into that. But as you can imagine, my wife died in April, so there's been other personal issues going on, then, which are rather more important than some thirty-year-old anarchist making allegations. Yeah, I'm very sorry to hear about your wife. Um, it was very sad. It's one of those things of this year, isn't it? It's terrible. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you for talking to me. Um, it's good to hear your side, even though we can't hear the full thing. I'm really sorry, and I would love to, I'd absolutely love to give you a chance in the verse, but um, it's very clear from a legal perspective I can't say anything until the undercover inquiry is met, because then I have the, the legal opportunity to say things which currently are covered by the initial team. That's the fundamental problem. Well, I look forward to hearing all of your sides when it comes to it. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, well, from 30 years ago, like I can remember it like yesterday, I don't think. <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> the bits maybe you can then. Well, certain bits I certainly know about, yeah. And there's quite a lot in the Tradecraft manual to go back to. Well, that's not, that's not just um, authored by me, of course, but people say I did author it, they just can't. The... There's a whole load of stuff in there, which I would say I probably did right, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting when, when it gets around to the kind of, to your, uh, the section that you guys were involved in. Oh gosh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, um, what is said, but you know, it's a public inquiry. One has to, one has to go through the small grinding cogs of the inquiry until such time as everything has been heard. Okay. Bye. Cheers. Bye now. I've obviously tried to speak to the Met Police and some of the other men in our story too, but like Andy, they didn't want to talk yet. They're saving it for the inquiry. That's the thing in this story. Of the dozens of undercover officers whose work's being investigated by the inquiry, there's only one who's ever been disciplined by the police. Which brings us to Jim Sutton, the vegan from Reclaim the Streets, otherwise known as Jim Boiling, the guy who had two children with Rosa. The Met charges him with gross misconduct on three counts. The first was having had the relationship with me while undercover. The second was lying to his vetting officers after he came back. And the third was security breach on the information that he shared with me. And he was found guilty on all of those. Through this hearing, Rosa gets a bit of detail on the files police hold on her. She discovers Jim filed a memo about her to the SDS just as they moved in together when she had the flu. And she realises his colleagues knew that she was pregnant when he was keeping her in hiding. Little did I know when I read in the misconduct that other officers saying it was common knowledge I was in the flat, that we weren't in hiding, we weren't trying to escape. That was, that was quite major news for me, reading that. But Rosa doesn't think Jim takes the whole misconduct hearing very seriously. For one, at the last minute, he says he won't appear in person, and there are signs he sees it all as a bit of a joke. In one of his witness statements, he writes... That I was working as a waitress when he first met me and leaving out the phrase cocktail bar, which is comes from a, a game that he'd spoken of, of between him and Lambert and the other officers of inserting son lyrics into documents, including, um, with, I think, extra points for the more, the more serious document you can insert it into. And this was his witness statement when he was being questioned about sexual offences charges. I, I don't think for one minute he ever thought that he'd be anything but protected. So Jim gets a guilty verdict. He can't work as a police officer anymore. But he's done his 30 years of service already and he won't take a big financial hit. By the time it did happen, he'd, he'd had enough credits to receive his pension before being sacked. And it's the same for almost all of them. They do their service and they get their pension. On top of these police complaints and the women's civil claims, there have also been legal challenges that allege the officer's behavior was tantamount to rape. But the Crown Prosecution Service says there's not enough evidence to bring sex crime charges. Monica, a Reclaim the Streets activist who had a relationship with Jim Boiling before Rosa, is appealing that decision.
In the background of all these stories, behind every officer and their scandals, there's a betrayed family. And this is something lots of people have asked me about over the course of this series. The wives of the officers. What happened to them? Until now, they've stayed out of the public eye and asked for privacy. Many of them feel they were let down by their husbands and the police. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the afternoon session of the Day 3 opening statements at the Undercover Policing Inquiry. The day has finally come for the officers' wives to give their side to Justice Mitting. Good afternoon, sir. Um, as you know, my name is Angus McCulloch, and together with... The barrister for the wives. The Category M participants were some of the wives, now the ex-wives, of undercover officers. They were the mothers of their children, the family they came home to. They were a vital part of the practical operation, a way of trying to keep the undercover officers grounded and of ensuring that they remembered which side they were on and a tether to normal life. He's representing three ex-wives of former undercover officers, but he says there are no doubt others whose husband's conduct is being investigated. The inquiry will hear from many whose most intimate lives have been affected by the practices of undercover policing. Heart-rending stories of betrayal and deceit. But there has been little focus on the harm done to the wives of undercover officers. Their sacrifices went way beyond those that they had willingly taken on and have had a shattering impact on each of their lives and that of their wider families, as they've come to learn something of the reality of their husband's roles. This has cost each of them their marriage and had a profound ongoing psychological impact. They hope that this will come to be recognised and that their voices are heard in this inquiry. Before the deployments, superiors at the SDS visited their homes and encouraged them to support their husbands. And the police gave a clear impression that the men would be infiltrating dangerous groups. Not protesters that pose no significant threat to the officers or their families. This aspect is particularly important given the enormous stress that the fear of reprisals caused for each of the women both during and after deployments. Hearing their side of the story when you've spent so long listening to those of the activists tricked into relationships is pretty galling. The practicalities of their husband's work and its impact on their families. You know, I made nice dinners and he'd watch telly. The weekends, we would see my friends. The nights, days, weekends or weeks away. We used to go to Scotland every year. We went to India, Crete, Israel. The work trips abroad. Thailand, Vietnam now look as if they were holidays with their unsuspecting partners. Like we can finally, we can go to the Dolomites. We can or go part of the extraction process at the end of a deployment. He suddenly announced that he was going to have to go away and he had to sort his head out. Years later, they found out that their marriages were based on lies, that their husband's jobs, of which they had been so proud, had been vehicles for the worst kind of infidelity. They have been left to reconstruct their lives and those of their children, forever tainted by their connection with men who have behaved so appallingly. So what once brought them pride now brings them shame and fear. The wives want three things from the inquiry recognition from the police of the impact and damage it's had on them, and they want an apology, like that given to the first eight women. They also want to know if their ex-husbands had to be married in order to do this work. Who within the SDS knew about the sexual relationships, and were they encouraged or authorised? And some of these questions are the same as those the women in this story want answers to. They want full disclosure from the Met, and they hope that the inquiry, at long last, will give them that. You know, we wanted answers. We wanted to see our files. We wanted to know why they want to see all the reports that these officers had written on us. We wanted to see, you know, the evidence of our lives tracked by the people who we were um, in relationships with. 
He would be willing to meet me, apparently. But you know, what would be the point? Am I going to believe anything he would say? You know, for me, I sort of did consider it because I've got so many questions. But how am I going to... They're trained liars. Anyone that can do that job for five years has got to be narcissistic or sociopathic. Disclosure's a big part of what we want and what we need. Was he authorised to come to my father's funeral? Did they know when we were on holiday alone together? Was he supposed to be on leave? Who read our text messages? Who oversaw him? Who saw photographs? Who knew what? Who was paying him to do those things? There's just so many questions. Once the inquiry's gone over all this, its final task is to find out if this kind of undercover work's still happening. Are the police spying on political groups? And if they are, have their tactics changed? Intention, uh, in the written opening or the oral, it's the oral Met Police's opening. turn to give their opening statement at the undercover policing inquiry. Peter Skelton speaking on behalf of them when Judge Mitting does something surprising. He interrupts to ask a pertinent question. Do they still have spies in left-wing groups? You haven't actually answered my first questions and I can readily understand uh, not wishing to do so on the hoof now. But they are questions which in due course uh, I will want to be answered. Uh, and um, I would ask you and those behind you uh, to address them at the right time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Skelton clearly wasn't expecting that. Now, I told you earlier that SDS and MPORU have closed, and that's true. But it's not actually as straightforward as that, because they've been absorbed into the National Domestic Extremism Unit, a branch of the Special Operations Group, or SO15. That's the Met's Counterterrorism Command. And their work, as you might imagine, is top secret. This is one for David Tucker from the College of Policing. Does this kind of, like, infiltrating political groups, like, will that be going on then? I can't, I can't say, I don't know. <laughs> what is the scale of undercover work in the UK at the moment and has it changed over the last couple of decades? Can't say. <laughs> no. No, we're not we don't we don't comment on that. Okay. Is it likely that it has as much resource as it had back then? Yeah, we don't comment on that. I mean the operating environment has changed. So policing has changed to to deal with that. So the you know the the internet, digital world, um, creates some opportunities, but it also closes some doors. So I'm not sure how much we've learnt from David Tucker there. I do appreciate his attempts to answer my questions, even if he did say, I don't know, nearly 30 times over the course of our interview. But I asked Donal O'Driscoll from the Undercover Research Group. I think it would be naive to expect no police monitoring altogether. He still gets regular messages from people who think they're being spied on. Usually around one, one or two a month. I think we've seen enough material to be confident in saying it's still ongoing. And who might they be monitoring? Groups like Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matters will remain a target. It's been an interesting time for protest groups recently. Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion have made headlines for organising some of the biggest protests in the last couple of decades. And they've also quietly cropped up on the police radar. Extinction Rebellion was listed alongside Greenpeace, Peter and Stop the Badger Cull on a leaked police training document about groups that they say have an extreme ideology, but they won't be drawn on whether or not they're monitoring them. So say this undercover work in political groups is still going on. What about the tactics? I asked Connor Woodman, the researcher, do you think if there is this undercover work going on in groups like XR, you would still get the relationships and Asian provocateur behaviour. Oh, absolutely. Including the relationships? Yeah, I would, I would say almost certainly. I asked David Tucker. After all, he is in charge of training undercovers and setting the standards for them. 
So what's changed in the wake of this scandal? I start with sexual relationships. No, well, no, it isn't acceptable. And the, the guidance now says you, you can't do it, won't be authorised as part of an operation. And the wording has just changed on this, is why I'm hesitating a bit. But, it, but essentially, we think that there are almost no circumstances in which it would be appropriate for a police officer to have a relationship with, well, you know, whilst performing their duty as an un undercover officer. <laughs> we never want to say never, but it is difficult to think of circumstances where it would be appropriate, but we don't want to say never. Why would you not want to say never? Um, because, um, because we don't, because we can't, we can't um, anticipate every, every circumstance. I just ask because I know it's been a discussion about whether this should be actually criminalised. Yeah, um, and I, I can understand why they might want to do that. But as I say, we, you know, in, in the law, um, there is always a, there is always a defence of necessity. So whatever we put into, into, a, into guidance could always be overcome by um, what, what the law, what the law would allow. So sexual relationships aren't banned. And despite campaigns from the women and others, it doesn't look like they're going to be criminalised. In fact, it's still OK for undercovers to have a relationship if it could threaten their cover or safety. I always hesitate to say it can never happen again, but make it almost impossible for, the, for that situation to arise again. But they have changed the requirement for officers to be married. And instead, potential recruits have to undergo rigorous psychological testing. And the challenge for us um, now is to make sure that those types of um, behaviour are spotted earlier and people who are suffering stress are identified earlier and we support them in the best way we can. And if that means they've got to be withdrawn, they've got to be withdrawn. But I'll let Neil Woods, the former undercover cop, have the final word here. If anyone wants to do some secret whistleblowing from SO15, please come and seek me out. I promise to just discuss it on Signal and no other medium. And also feel free to contact me. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> We're nearing the end of the series. We've heard the intimate details of these relationships. The women have told us about holidays in Italy, investigations in South Africa and heartbreak back home. We've pored over the tradecraft manual and confronted the police. But the hunt for the truth isn't over and the inquiry has plenty of questions yet to answer. For the women we've been following, this story is part of their daily lives and the consequences are far reaching. It'll be 10 years in October coming that we had that meeting in the room and I still haven't felt able to open myself up to a new relationship. That's Lisa. It's been a decade since she broke up with Mark the Climber, the one with the flashy shades. I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to fall in love again or trust feelings of love. I've now got to the stage where I'm in my mid to late 40s and I am single and I don't have a family. I haven't had children. I will never know how whether that was my decision, whether that was my choice in life, or whether that was just something that happened because I spent my 30s with a person that didn't exist. And, I'm, and then I spent my 40s dealing with that. However much I put my life back together, I'll never get those years back, and they, they stole those years from me. You know, I didn't give them up, I didn't waste them, they were taken from me. Each woman's dealt with the trauma in their own way. Once Alison had enough evidence that Birkenhead Mark with the scraggy ponytail was a spy, she found solace in her local community. She switched career and reconnected with old friends. Well, I think I've been incredibly lucky. I don't know, I always feel a bit funny saying it, but I think it is the truth. I think because I come from a very, very small Jewish community, um, I was able to have a relationship with somebody who basically I grew up with, who I grew apart from for 20 odd years, and then was able to come back to. Um, and, you know, I knew, his, you know, we went to the same primary school. And so that allowed me to 
you know, have a new relationship. And then within a year, I think I was pregnant. But Mark's shadow still hangs over her life. I'm less idealistic, far less idealistic. Um, I've always been skeptical about stuff, but I think I'm probably even more skeptical these days. And fundamentally, I think it made, it made the world more complex. She spends hours each week working on the Police Spies Out of Lives campaign. And whenever she visits her mum's house, Mark's face is there, beaming at her from a picture on the mantelpiece. You want to see it? I'll go and get it, just a minute. Yeah, it's at my wedding, just a second. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So could you point out which one he is? OK, so that's him next to Alison. It's the same for Jane, who's sitting on a cushion she got from Mark the Climber when we speak. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think there's a couple of other items like that that I've ended up with of his that are still in my life that remind me of him. I ended up with his coat. It's sort of funny. Rosa finds it difficult to put into words the impact Jim's lies have had on her life because it's been so profound. I think, similar to a lot of the women I live with, flashbacks and trauma, I've sealed myself off from as much as possible, but that means you're sealed off from the joy and beauty of life as well. Would you be able to talk just a little bit about um, you and your children and the life you lead now and how it, how it has affected you long term? I don't know. I think it'd be useful for me to do that. Um, I don't think I've ever said anything really out loud properly and anything I say sounds like it would just be glib or too personal. I'd like to, though. I think the ramifications are beyond words, really. My youngest I had through a donor because there's absolutely no way I would have been able to have gotten into a relationship. I didn't want to have to bury all my children and I needed to be the party person making the most of the time that they had and to do that I needed I needed to um, put a little sweetness in the space of pain. Rose's third child's another girl and she's healthy. She adores her brother and sister and is so deeply caring for them. She has nothing to do with the operations and yet she's had to grow up knowing both her siblings are born out of a spying operation on her mum by the state of the country that she lives in, which is it's not a place really, it's not a place that you'd want any child psychologically to be. Rosa now sees her whole relationship with Jim in quite a sinister light. So do you believe that he came back into the relationship as a containment exercise? Oh, absolutely. In other words, Rosa believes Jim only got back together with her after she discovered who he really was in order to keep the police's secrets safe. He doesn't have access to your children now? Theoretically, he does. Yeah. Theoretically, in law, he's still... There is still no protection for myself or the children in that way, from him accessing our family. Um, and there should be. Rosa's eldest two children, the ones she had with Jim, need full-time care, and they can't comprehend what it means for their father to have been an undercover cop. But she wants the police to apologise to them. As for Rosa's youngest daughter, she has her own take on Jim. My youngest calls him fuckface. For the women who discovered more recently that their ex-boyfriends were undercover police, the effects have been different, but no less real. I mean, you know, the worst possible thing in my estimation has happened already. An undercover officer has reported on me, my family, my friends. That's Lindsay, who's determined not to let Carlo the Italian's lies destroy her sense of self. But I, I, I talked to myself about it and I deliberately said, do not adopt paranoia. Don't try, try not to mistrust people if at all possible, because then that fundamentally changes me and my character, and that's what I didn't want, because then they've won. Sarah's only known James Straven's real identity for about 18 months. It's still quite raw. It's made me feel very insecure. One of the things I think is, Christ, if something happened, where would I go? Who wants to go to the police now, you know? The trust at a base level has been 
destroyed. In some ways, the revelations have crushed the women's passion for activism. Jessica would love to be more involved in campaigning for the environment. I see um, you've got an Extinction Rebellion logo there behind you. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Have you been involved much with them? No, no. There's. Um, I'm still. I'm still quite. I don't like to go places where there's lots of police. You know, I've been to sort of. I think I've, the only demonstration I think that I've been to, other than the ones in Peterborough, is the um, the Donald Trump one um, in London. But other than that, it's yeah. I'm still not properly. I'm not confident enough to be around like a lot of police. It's it's not it's not a nice feeling. Quite vulnerable. That noise you can hear in the background is Jessica's parrot, Lenny. He's quite the character, chirping away and nagging when you don't pay him enough attention. He's been a comfort for her these last three years, ever since the news that Andy Van was actually Detective Inspector Andy Coles. It's hit her hard and she's had to have counselling and take antidepressants. Every time that there's some sort of new information or there's a new story or something comes out. It's just, you know, you almost, you're back to the beginning again. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's relentless. You could say the Met Police ultimately failed at spying on these political groups. Officers went too far and in doing so, they sowed the seeds of their own downfall. They didn't count on the sheer determination and tenacity of the women. The people who were spied on have now come together. They've exposed the officers and they've started new campaign groups. They've got a new fight and this one's personal. Do you think you'll ever be able to let it go to put it in the past? I'm not sure that anyone can ever really, you know, put something completely in the past like this. And I'm not sure that I'd want to really either because Lots of really good things have come out of it, in a way. You know, we have exposed stuff that wouldn't have got exposed. I've written lots and lots, and we're also contributing to a group kind of memoir of how we came together, and that's a really positive thing. In a way, the tables have turned a bit, really, because it feels like they're the ones who've lost. And so for now, the women in our story are doing what they do best, fighting for change and the truth. Their focus was once animal rights, the environment, anti-racism and trade unionism. Now it's the police and the justice system itself. And it's all set against a backdrop of deep personal suffering. Through some very dark times, it's this new campaign and their friendship with one another that's kept them going. So you are going to drink some wine? I, I, oh, you have beer. Yeah, there is much wine. Before yeah. the pandemic, they'd get together regularly, whether it's to discuss their legal case or just drink a glass of wine. But for the time being, it's Zoom calls full of laughter and warmth. Have another one, have another one. Yeah, you could share the music to the rest of us. Oh, that would be, that's a good idea. Should I try and do that? <laughs> We've got fun lights we can put on, you know, disco lights and stuff. And like, you know when like Harry... Harriet's birthday, yeah, exactly. Oh, what well, is his birthday? It was we brilliant. have such and a we... laugh in those meetings. <laughs> that you, was that your film, was, your, I was your, banned, actually. Well, your, your song was vetoed, wasn't it? Your tune was vetoed. Yeah, yeah so I didn't bother list. coming. Yeah, so fuck you all. <laughs> oh, maybe we just need to... We're missing all getting drunk together, that's it. Yeah. I'm Cara McGugan and this was Bed of Lies. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed the show, please do leave a five-star rating and a short review on Apple Podcasts. It'll help new listeners find us and help share the stories of the women we've spoken to. Please do consider taking out a Telegraph subscription. We couldn't have made this podcast without our subscribers. You can sign up for 30 days free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash lies podcast. Don't forget that you can find exclusive details and pictures from the series, as well as updates from the inquiry as they come, in my reporter's notebook at telegraph.co.uk forward slash bed of lies. Bed of Lies was written by me, Cara McGugan, and produced by Sarah Peters at Tuning Fork Productions. The executive producer was Theodora Leloudis and sound designs by Peregrine Andrews. I'd also like to thank Andy McKenzie and Elliot Daly for their help with the series. Do get in touch with me if you have any questions or ideas for more series like this. I'm on Twitter at CJ McGugan 
and you can email podcasts at telegraph.co.uk.